Hello everyone and welcome back to my career mode let's play slash tutorial in Kerbal Space Program 1.4.1 and in this episode we're going to begin by unlocking my favorite engines in the game the Spark and the Ant. Now this is of course a little bit counterintuitive they are the small engines and I have mentioned in the previous episode I hinted that I was really pining for them I really think highly of small engines and uh, yeah we're going to unlock those after having uh, the only other uh, I'd say 90 unit tier technology that we've unlocked is electrics and this is the next one that I go for uh, but again uh, not everybody agrees with my methods and we'll see the benefits and drawbacks of this the benefit is of course we're going to be able to continue making small rockets to achieve things and uh, well let me just uh, get to the VAB to show you what I've got Okay, so what we have here is a nice, neatly packaged probe with the Probodovodyne Octo, thermometer, barometer, two goo containers, two solar panels at the top, two antennae, and two batteries. And we're going to add two ant engines, but first, uh, just one ant engine would be a good idea because actually it's sufficient. But uh, there's a trade-off. If we put one ant engine, then there's no way we're going to bring this back off the ground. It's going to tip over on landing when it uh, hits that and maybe the little reaction wheel in the Probodovodine Octo could help but it's, uh, it's a dodgy business uh, and we have a thousand six hundred and forty two meters per second like that and if we have two of them and the way we do that is uh, we put it off to the side here uh, snap is probably helpful and then just tilt it and so now we've got two and I'm going to tweak it so that the nozzles are in line with the base. And you can see we have 1,558. So that's another way to radially attach these things. And if you wanted to smooth it out, uh, we don't really have the small nose cones, and that nose cone is way too big for this sort of thing. So yeah, you'd have to wait until you unlock the technology with small nose cones to make sure you don't have like a square hitting the atmosphere, but if you're going to launch without a fairing, of course. Um, so that, there's a trade-off here. Either we use two of them and uh, in order to make sure that it doesn't tip over, or we use one and we use landing struts. Well, let's see what that looks like. So here we have 1,642. We try and put the uh, smallest landing struts well, they're rather big compared to this. And let's say four of them. 1,412. Well, you know, it's not that bad. When you think about it, we need about 1,000 to land on the moon. So it, it's, it's an option. Um, I, I think I will go with this, come to think of it. Our thrust weight ratio is fine. If we take a look at our thrust weight ratio for the moon, that's two, so it's more than enough. And yeah, I mean, it, it looks, you know, vaguely insect insectoid. Hopefully it's not going to be too horrible passing through Kerbin's atmosphere without a fairing. We do not have fairings right now, I don't think. Nope. So we're just going to have to deal. And I've uh, negated the possibility of putting a nose cone at the top. So let's tuck these in a little bit better and build the rest of the rocket. Ah, well it's not letting me build the rocket that I want to build and that is my little spark rocket. Uh, six sparks at the bottom here, uh, one spark here. It's it's not necessarily the cheapest thing ever, uh, definitely not. Though when you talk about six of these, that's 1440 funds. Well, that's not too much more than the Civil or Reliant but it gets away with fewer tanks so that's nice now you can see we can lift off right now 1.24 and this single spark upper stage is has a thrust weight ratio greater than one so that's also nice and we need let's say 4000 to get to orbit and um, after that we have 1500 left to transfer to the moon or Minmus and to make orbit and that's more than enough and then this uh, little lander can definitely land so this definitely has enough delta V as 7,000 and it's only 8.3 tons uh, but it has too many parts hmm uh, cost 9,895 
Let's quickly take a look at our previous mission, the one we sent to Minmus, and see how much that costs. Because that was roughly similar, right? It had the probable Nine Octo and everything. Well, this, this says Min Minmus Science 1. That was 12,660. So this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, crazy expensive just because of the miniaturization. And actually, uh, the fact that we have a like, nice small probe now, thanks to the small engine, notice that the ant allows this entire probe to be 0.5 tons. Whereas the terrier engine, which we used to have to use before unlocking these two, is alone 0.5 tons. So, yeah, there's a substantial improvement in efficiency when you unlock these two engines. And that allows the entire rocket to be smaller. But maybe I'm going too far with this with my six little engines at the bottom. And uh, we can simplify for now. And then again, we don't really have a reaction wheel at the top. It might make me feel a little bit better for launch if we had a reaction wheel somewhere along the line. Those are expensive though. One of our annoyances right now is that we only have these decouplers and we don't have the smaller decouplers, the 0.625 meter decouplers. Those would be handier here and uh, we would eventually like to use a uh, cone tank like, well not like this, this is the wrong size, but from 0.625 to 1.25 to smooth this out a little bit. Instead we've got this annoying thing. Okay, here we are on the launch pad, and before I forget, let me make sure to hibernate in warp on the probe core. Really should just do that in the VAB. And uh, I've dubbed this our Delta-1. This is our first Delta rocket. And because this is going to be uh, my Delta upper stage, if you will, the Spark. The original Delta rockets were named after the upper stage. Uh, the lower stage was actually called the Thor. And, of course, there was a Thor line of rockets, but eventually they started calling them Delta rockets based on the upper stage. Okay, so I'm going to use Smart ASS, and we're going to go to the moon to fill this transmitter recover scientific data from the surface of the moon contract. That is our goal. Okay, and... Well, and SAS first, and then launch. So the next question will be, can the Spark Engine help us to land a Kerbal on the moon? Oh, and where are all my windows? Land a Kerbal on the moon in under an 18-ton rocket. And we'll see. I don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, we're at 100 kilometers on the Apoapsis already. Uh, we can just coast a bit, actually. Oh, it's gonna knock us out. That was mean of it. And shut down. We're, we've got a little bit of a lopsided orbit, 143 by 73. But let's plot for the moon. Uh, we don't need to go with the nodes. Uh, just, let's say where the moon is about 45 to 60 degrees on that side. Here, on the opposite side, we're going to make our maneuver. So we're going to meet it over at 45 to 60 degrees. And if it looks like the apoapsis is intending towards that location, this is a little bit closer to the 45 than 60. I would rather have it closer to the 60, so I'm going to move it over. And if, uh, if you want to see whether you're getting the best spot, you can see that the moon is over here, and our, our apoapsis is going to be over here. We would like our apoapsis to be where the moon is. So let's turn it a little bit more this way. Whoa, 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 too fast. But that certainly suggests that this is a better version. And cannot delete. Oh, control locked. That's why. Oh, here we go again. Now, at least we're in orbit. Oh, somebody had uh, wondered whether I had the uh, other launch. Yeah, I've got to enable extra ground stations. So I don't know why. I mean, well, I mean, it's fair to have communication blackouts. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this. Okay, well, I mean, this is a good enough approach. Uh, so closer to 60 degrees, and we see ourselves with a, uh, well, very low moon periapsis there. Let's, well, on the burn, we'll boost it a little bit higher than that, but that's a fine plot. 
uh, we've lost communication again. And I'm not gonna... Well, I can't throttle up with uh, no communication. So, commsats. We will be needing them. So we're past our node right now. And I'll just have SAS hold. But it should be fine. But we will get this encounter. Now, moon landings aren't the only thing that's that are going to benefit from our new engines. The AND engine is great for putting up satellites. So our communication satellites, which would have been horribly overburdened by the Terrier engine. In other words, it would be very heavy and they'd have to be very big communication satellites. Now it can be very small communication satellites. And so now is the time to build your communication satellites because now we have the cute little ant engine and that's the key to putting your satellites where you want them. And we have enough uh, fuel in this stage to make sure that we capture. 40 by 26 is our current orbit and I think it'll be good to dispose of this stage by crashing it into the moon so we'll use it for the first part of descent and we want to descend where it's light and we have communication so basically that's going to be around here this time no avoiding that so on the opposite side we're going to make our initial descent burn descent orbit insertion I think it was called during the Apollo days maybe this crater will be fine though I'm worried it's too shadowed yeah let's try for this crater actually Okay, and set, and ant. Deer down. The ant engine has two kill newtons, basically, 1.8 it says. So this has substantially more delta V than our previous Minmus lander and would be great on Minmus, really. This would be spectacular for that particular mission, getting more science from Minmus. So now our vertical speed is negative, and I think I've given the engine enough time to complete the remainder of the burn here. The further away we are from the crater edge, the better as far as the sun's concerned. So I would like to just stop it right here. Maybe not right there, maybe right around here would be fine. Then again, it seems pretty firm on its legs. Okay, a little bit of a hop. Oh, it's got to tip over? No, come on. Reaction wheel. All right. Um, we are not recharging right now. And even if I turned it, I don't think we'd be recharging with the sun like that. I don't know. Um, let's do log temperature. Transmit. So, east crater. Barometer. Transmit. And, okay, I'm going to do a little hop and a pirouette to try and turn us. See if we can recharge. Oh, I did too much of a pirouette. Ah, uh, I hopped. Ah. Uh, those were very resilient antennae. Okay, well, let's retract the gear. Let's try and get upright. There we go. Um, maybe we can pirouette there. Okay, extend the line of gear. Oh, too much of a hop, but it's it's all right. It's all right. No, nope, uh, we're not recharging right now with the sun like that. Mm. I do want to do a goo container. Uh, let's time warp. Is the sun gonna improve its position? Yes, it's rising and we're good now. Okay, now observe Mr. Goo. And transmit. Yes. Okay, well. 
Hopping on the moon is completely different from hopping on Minmus, and considering how badly I did it on Minmus, this isn't necessarily going to work, but we're going to try and bounce over to over there, above the crater, out of, out of the crater. So, here we go. What I want is to make sure that my surface velocity never exceeds my delta V, obviously. That would be important. And I'm watching my time to apoapsis here to make sure that I'm still going up and also vertical speed up there. But I don't want to go too far up, otherwise I'll come down hard and use a lot of fuel to take care of that. I think we're not going high enough. Oh shoot. I was looking at the numbers and then pay attention to the terrain. I think we should what do we have left to us? We might actually have made it above the crater. Mm, we lost our engine. That's not going to help. But we still have our little probe core and reaction wheel. Hey, can we do a goo from here? Yeah. Um, Space near the moon. We have 10 electric charge though. We lost both of our antennae. I'd rather just, like, not. I mean, we're not, I don't think we can transmit any of the signs with just 10. So, once again, the art of lithobraking, breaking. Practice number two. Oops. Well, that didn't work out for us. Alright, but we got some science, and we should have fulfilled the missions. Our next contract is to land a Kerbal on the moon. So, let's see what it will take to do that. Okay, so this is my lander configuration at least for landing on the moon and hopefully getting back home. And I decided to put landing gear on this just to be safe though. I thought about landing on the baguettes just because it'd be funny to say we have successfully landed on our baguettes. Houston, we have successfully landed on our baguettes. But um, I did note that it had an impact tolerance of 5 meters per second, which is, I mean... It's just marginally worse than other parts, but I, I just took note of that and decided to shy away from it. The engines are 7 meters per second, so the baguettes are even worse than the engines. And we just saw us losing some engines. The landing struts, by the way, uh, impact tolerance is 10. Not, not great still, but... And actually, they seem much more resilient than that when we're doing lithal braking, but it depends on the exact angle you pick and everything. But... Yeah, so that's that's a start right there. It's a 3.5, let's say, ton lander. Has 2,265 meters per second. Now, if you're figuring it's got to take maximum 300 to make orbit, uh, then maybe 900 to land, 1,200. And then tops 800 to take off again, but probably 700. Let me go with 700. Uh, 1,900 up to that and then 300 to get back home, then this is enough. As long as we don't take more than 900 to land and 700 to take off again, we should be fine. But it's still tight, so it'd be nice to get the lower stage to get us into orbit around the moon, and then we'll, we should be golden. And other than that, we're not carrying any goo containers, and I actually forgot to slap the thermometer and barometer. Let me do that. So there's that. We could help it out here by trimming off some of the ablator on the heat shield. Uh, for instance, if, uh, if we carry full ablator, we have 2,260. If we cut off 100 ablator, we basically get 100 meters per second from that. But for the first time with a Kerbal to the moon, I think we should carry all the ablator. Well, I mean, technically we've been in lunar orbit, uh, lunar orbit before, so... But I don't remember the number now. So anyway, we've got thermometer and barometer, but now we're over the part count limit, but that's academic. We don't have enough delta V from our launcher to get us over there. So we've got uh, overburdened LV-99 uh, stage. The Terrier is, that has a 0.72 thrust weight ratio there, and that's still with it in the atmosphere, so that's not great. And even with the Reliant engine at the bottom, we have barely enough thrust to weight ratio. We've got an 18 ton rocket almost and the Delta V doesn't get us to orbit. So we can't do it under 18 tons like this. Well, we're going to have to come up with something different.
So finally, at long last, I will upgrade the launch pad because we cannot do this mission in 18 tons, at least not with my mission style. And I, I like to stick to my style and not make stuff that's really ugly. So, but that prevents us from upgrading the vehicle assembly building right now because that requires 450. If we take a look at our contracts, which we haven't done in a while actually, temperature surveys of the moon, not really hot on those types of contracts. I'm sort of picky. Plant a flag on the moon though, I think that's something we're going to do. So we can pick that up. Rescue from orbit of the moon. Hmm. That's something to think about. Science data from space around the moon, sure. Should be able to get uh, another EV report at least. Haul that into flight. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's not worth it. Um, this rescue is intriguing, but I don't feel like this is the best thing to do right now. To save on the part count though, we really need better tanks, and so we actually don't have quite enough science for this because we need general construction, which is here. And on the bright side, that is structural fuselage, which I'm going to like using. But um, we need fuel systems, and we don't have enough science for fuel systems. Yeah, and that'll give us the bigger tanks that allow us to avoid the high part counts. Okay, so I've modified my lander to be a moon rescue craft now. We took off the lander legs, the science, and now we've just got the spark engine and the fuel tanks, obviously. And, of course, a Probodobodyne Octo core, and we are not going to have crew on board. Bye-bye, Jeb. Now, it might be a good idea before I launch this, though, to launch our communication satellites, right? Because this isn't going to have crew on board, and we would like to maintain communication and make sure we can do the transfer at the right time. But basically, that is our first use of strap-on boosters, which is uh, putting boosters on the side with a decoupler. And they're called strap-on boosters because uh, this can launch without them, technically, though barely. Uh, if they are required to launch, they are not strap-on boosters. So they're like on-demand boosters. You, uh, you can add them when you need them, is the idea. This is also our first use of the launch stability enhancer. And I've only got one because of our part count limit but I'd feel better with one than none. I've used the swivel at the core here to make sure that we have better control, though of course we do have... I don't know if we will have the reaction wheel in the command pod, but I think we should have that 5 torque in addition to the Probe Double Nines torque, but just in case this swivel will, be, swivel will be a good idea. And then we have a terrier engine here. And so my intention is that these three stages... Well, however you want to count it, uh, two and a half stages really with the boosters. Uh, the boosters count as half a stage because we're lining the swivel at the start too. Um, that they will get us to orbit and then the pod will just transfer, get to orbit, and then return on its own. Uh, our target Kerbal, who needs to be rescued, uh, is in sort of an inclined orbit, an odd orbit, so that'll be interesting to rendezvous with. But, oh, and I also thrust limited the thumpers here. But maybe I should put the communication network up first. Let me put that together. Okay, everyone, this is going to be our first commsat. And what makes it a commsat is that, first of all, we picked a relay antenna for our main antennae instead of a Commutron 16, which is a direct antenna and cannot do relay. And so th that's important. It can bounce signals. And we actually have two of them because I need to balance it out, and I don't think the reaction wheel in the Probodobodyne Octo Core is good enough to keep the balance while this engine is running. Uh, the engine, the little ant engine, will get us to the correct orbit, and we've got 1,558 meters per second to do that, which is plenty. Um, we do have the battery, and we have solar panels, so we need these things to make it a good, good commsat. But that's about it. Now, we would like more than one, because that'll help with signals, and it seems like with a 0.5 ton 
probe that we could probably launch more than one at, at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a nose cone on here just for aerodynamics. I picked this. It's a little bit big, obviously, and might block the solar panels uh, somewhat, though we'll hope that we're facing the sun on you know a broad side. And uh, I could have used the parachute, but it's heavier. And I'd, you can see, as far as the delta V we lose by adding this, we lose about 100. And I would rather not lose more. It's a shame also that we don't have stacked separators instead of stacked decouplers. Uh, the difference is that stack separators don't stay stuck to both uh, to one side. Uh, this will stay stuck to the bottom one. Uh, basically, it'll be the same situation as with the nose cone. Uh, stack separators. You can make a stack separator right now if you want to create one by doing this. And now, <clears throat> and now they'll stay stuck to each other, but not stay stuck to either probe. But that's extra mass, and I don't want to bother with that. Um, though it'll unburden the bottom probe, but I think it'll be all right. Mm, maybe it'll be neater. All right, I'll, I'll do it just this once. Okay, so what we want to do here, though, is we want to copy this probe. And how do you do that? Well, first, I want to reroute. The octo was the root part initially, and I want to change that to the nose cone. Okay, now the nose cone is the root part for everything. And again, you just click reroute, click a uh, part that isn't the root part that you want, and then click the part that is the root part that you want. And now I'm going to hold down Alt, click the probe, and put it down here. And that's how we duplicate parts. And we could do that again now. Now we have three of them. But our part count is getting a little bit high. Oh, that's, that's a good reason why we don't want to make the stack separators, huh? Uh, we're adding a lot more part count. Yeah, I think we need at least three parts. Let's just launch two of these at a time for now. I think just doing a single stage to orbit would be a good idea here. The payload is relatively light. It's our part count that's limiting. If we had more than 30 parts available to us, we could easily manage this a little bit better and launch three probes, three comsats. So, comsat one, sat one and two. Mm -hmm. That's four thousand meters per second down there, which should be enough to get us to orbit. Just for kicks, I'll throw in some basic fins. Okay, it's nighttime on a launch pad, but that just means that we have extra reason to get on with it quickly. So, because our electric charge is uh, running down here, make sure that we've got the right engine lighting initially. I really wish those windows would stay up. I that th th it's a way to keep them up. I I don't know why they keep hiding on me. All right, so here we go. We just go into low carbon orbit initially, and then after that, we'll have the satellites place themselves into their correct orbit. And I'll show you what what uh, constitutes uh, Keo stationary orbit. A stationary orbit around Kerbin, which will ensure that the satellite will be in contact with the same locations at all times. But that doesn't mean that you have to put uh, ComSat into that kind of orbit. I think I might have misjudged how much I would need. At least the VAB advertised more Delta V than I then we, well, I, I guess I was going too shallow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to toss it into a steep trajectory with a lot of time to apoapsis. You'll note that going up here. So now we've got three minutes to deal with this. So I'm going to throttle down, set, and we're going to separate again. We're going to start by getting this to orbit. We are going a little bit high, and it's not the most efficient thing to do, but I need to get to the other one. Okay, so that puts it firmly in orbit. Let's switch to the other one, which is currently in a dire situation. It's still going up though, that's nice. It's got this stupid hoop on it, but we will forgive it for- oh, it did it- ah, oh, it lost one. That's- hopefully it doesn't unbalance it. Okay, anyway. Alright, so we are in orbit. I don't know if this is going to get to Keo stationary orbit. Now, um, both of our 
comsats are in really wicked sort of situations. So Keo stationary orbit is 2,868 kilometers, that's the altitude, and it's circular at that altitude. And you want to make sure it reaches uh, its orbit over the location that you want to be communicating with. In this case, right around here would be nice, right? We keep losing communication right around here. So first thing we want is one that's going to cover this area, you know, right after we launch here. Once we pass the Eastern Peninsula, we keep losing communication around here. So that's what we want. And you can see these two are talking to each other, but I, I don't see... Let's see, uh, let's switch to... We're going to call this one ComSat 1, the one that reached orbit first. The one with the nose cone. So I'm going to rename it ComSat 1. Okay. So now, what I want is to... Well, let's, let's just plot it out. Let's see if it's possible to reach the orbit that we want with 672 meters per second left. And there's a failure of the launcher rather than the poor probe here. So what we would do is we would first lift it to its target apoapsis, 2,868, uh, right there. And then we'll wait until it happens to be over the target site at its apoapsis and then circularize. So the circularization burn and what we want is a one day orbit and because if it uh, orbits in a day and that's the same time that Kerbin rotates then it'll stay over the same place the whole time. Now how much is this burn here? 439 meters per second though. We don't have that. So we can't make it a good uh, geostationary orbit. What are our other options? Well, we could make it half of that. Or we could make it a uh, Molnia orbit where it's just uh, overboosted. We could make it overboosted and have it stay over that location for an extended period of time. See, it's going to be slower over here and then faster over here. So wherever we set its apoapsis, as long as it's periodic, and right now, you know, as long as it's a six hour orbit or maybe a three hour orbit, because Kerbin takes six hours to rotate on its axis, that will do. Any three hour orbit or six hour orbit would be a good place to put your commsats. And maybe we should just go with three hour orbits around uh, covering uh, this stretch here. Okay, we've passed the geostationary level. This is an orbit of three hours, a little bit more than that. Six hour orbit might be the way to go for me. Right now we're basically over the location that I want, right? There's the KSC, there's the Eastern Peninsula. And as we go out to Apoapsis, we're maintaining communication. You can see we're maintaining a nice communication with everything. We're a little bit slow though. We seem to be more over the KSC. I would like us to be a little bit further to the east. Okay, now we're pretty much directly over the KSC. And so if we go one more round, we will be, we'll end up 45 minutes ahead of the KSC. And that's roughly 45 degrees. Because six hours, it's a convenient thing. Uh, because Kerbin rotates in six hours, that's 360 minutes, which means it rotates one degree every minute. And so if you're 45 minutes ahead of the KSC, in your orbit, then, and we're talking about six hour orbits, then that means you're 45 degrees. Okay, and so now we're half an hour, and then on the way back we'll make up the other 15 minutes. And so at periapsis, I want to get up to the six hour orbit now. And of course, it's not going to stay where you want it to stay unless it's exactly the right orbital period. There's a difference between two different types of period, two different types of day, if you will. For instance, uh, we're used to a 24-hour day for Earth, but if you really want to stay, at, but that's because uh, the sun, our location with respect to the sun moves a little bit every day. Uh, it's by about four seconds. And so, oh, sorry, four minutes. And so the actual period for something staying above the same location around the Earth is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. So it's 3 minutes and 56 seconds that uh, we had 
we uh, sort of move around the sun in our orbit and so the sun to be in the same place at the same time uh, we have to add those three minutes and 56 seconds to make it the full 24 hours so it's a little bit complicated but I'm just gonna assume um, we want an over period of one day here and we've got one day and 0.4 seconds can I thrust limit this enough to oh man one one hundredth of a second here that deserves thrust limiting of 0.5 okay there it goes uh, there we go uh, five hours 59 minutes and uh, dang it it changed it on me it was perfect just now well sort of okay I'll take that it's fine and so right here we have two hours to apoapsis basically and this is the intended service location you can see the KSC would be blocked it's not above the horizon for a probe but this can facilitate communications to other ground stations and it can do so for four hours out of its six hour orbit at least 50 percent now what we want is the other probe the other commsat to be offset from this one just enough to make sure that it covers when the see this one is now to the west of the KSC so not really where we wanted the communication support so if we had another commsat at a 90 degree angle or maybe a 120 degree angle over here then it can cover the area that we were looking for maybe even uh, directly opposite like 180 degrees one right here let's take a look at commsat 2 and see where we can best put it well it's periapsis is here and so the best thing to do is just just to burn out a periapsis and lift your apoapsis it's not necessary to put it into a different orbit like this by the way you could put it into the same orbit and just make sure that when that one is coming in this one is on its way up right so you can have the same sort of thing going but I think diversification in this case would be a good idea and so I'm going to actually put it into this orbit previously in other little commsat configurations I made little clover leaves where they were all sort of synchronized and of course this is not the ideal situation this is not the geostationary or geostationary satellite constellation that I had originally intended to launch this is uh, due to a failure of the launch being I think it was a little bit shallow and so we were facing a lot more drag than we should have and we lost Delta V because of that so yeah uh, not not the constellation I was envisioning but it's the constellation we're going to end up with and what we'd really like is if that one and this one arrived at their periapsis at the same time so they're sort of synchronized and then we'll make sure that they're on their way out when we launch if we really want to be careful about communications we'll keep an eye on our commsats as long as we haven't already built up the entire commsat network and obviously two commsats uh, not gonna cover everything but it's a start the periapsis for this one is a little bit higher than for the other one. Okay, uh, not zero. That's not going to work. The magic 0.5, the minimum thrust we can set it to. So let's just see how they work together. The KSC is right now there, and this would not be a good time to launch, quite obviously. But these are heading out now if we had a third satellite then I think that would help so we're in the part where that one is covering the launch situation and this is covering a different area here let's go back and I think I'll save the rescue around the moon for the next episode we did a little introduction to ant engines and spark engines and also um, some sort of introduction to commsats and perhaps we should do more introduction to commsats once we uh, launch a better pack out there but for now these are our two commsats and hopefully they will help in future missions and next time we will rescue that Kerbal around the moon 
So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.